I'm here to represent the Christadelphians that meet in this place. We don't just meet here in Nottingham. There's, there's three meetings in Nottingham. We also meet all over the world. Who are the Christadelphians? Well, we're just a group of ordinary people who believe that the Bible is God's word. We believe the claim of the Bible, for example, from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, which says that all scripture, all of what is contained in the Bible is given by inspiration of God. The word inspiration means God breathed. Every word in the Bible emanates from God himself. So when we read the Bible, when we read, for example, we've just read from the epistle of Paul to the Romans, we don't believe that this is Paul's opinion on things. When we read of the prophet in the prophets, for example, the prophet Ezekiel or Jeremiah, we don't believe it's their opinion. We believe that they were compelled by God to write down the words that we are reading. For example, it says in 2 Peter, chapter 1 and verse 21, that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So they were compelled, they were moved, they were driven to write the things that we're writing. You might say, well, that's wonderful, but what's this name Christadelphian? It's just a label, ladies and gentlemen. It simply means um, brethren in Christ. And as ordinary people, we are bound together by a common belief in the gospel message preached by Jesus and the apostles in the first century. And we seek to model our, our, our lives and our understanding around how they lived and conducted themselves right back at the beginning in the first century. But we also believe that we have discovered the truth of what the Bible teaches. We have a distinct understanding of the gospel. And we also believe that, sadly, mainstream Christianity has moved away from some of the core teachings that we find in the Bible. Now, because it's coming up to the Christmas season, we thought it was a great opportunity to share that understanding with you this evening. To share what the Bible says about the Lord Jesus Christ. And we hope to present to you this evening the real Christ. Before we dive into this subject, I think perhaps the best place for us to start is to appreciate what the Bible says about this subject and, and how important it actually is. Now, I'm going to be putting most of our passages this evening up on the screen. But at some points, I'm going to ask you to turn up some passages. So here's a few passages to, to talk about the importance of the subject. This is life eternal, says Jesus in prayer to God. He says, this is life eternal in John 17, verse 3, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And then in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16... The Apostle Paul, by inspiration, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Now these are, are massive statements, aren't they? Because what it's saying to us is this subject of who Jesus Christ is, is not a subject that we can treat lightly. It's not something that we can come to really casually. Because these verses are telling us that it really matters what we believe in regards to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we're going to have a look in, in, in the second part of our talk as we go through it to see exactly who Jesus is. Before doing this, though, I'd like to lay a few foundations. And we're going to ask a few questions like this one. Was Jesus a real person? Now, it's not really my, my job this evening to go into the historical Jesus, but I do want to, to say a couple of things. The scholars who write on the subject of whether Jesus was a real historical person overwhelmingly support that he was a real man. For example, this chap here, Michael Grant, he was actually an atheist, a historian. He didn't believe in God. And he applied his historian's mind to looking at the Gospels and to looking at the evidence of whether Jesus Christ existed as a real person. And this is what he concluded. He said, in recent years, no serious scholar 
has ventured to postulate the non-historicity of Jesus, or at any rate, very few, and they have not succeeded in disposing of the much stronger, indeed very abundant, evidence to the contrary. So here we have a historian, he's admitting that historically speaking, Jesus did exist. And not many people that you'd meet today would, would deny that. That Christ was a real character of history. Someone who, who trod um, the paths and the, and the roads of Israel about 2,000 years ago. And the impact that he has had on ethical thinking has been unsurpassed. The whole Western dating system, if you think about it, pays witness to his historical reality. And the majority of people, mainly because of Christmas, the majority of people in, in the Western world at least, all know of, of Jesus in some shape or form. So he was a real person, says the scholars. But, but who was he? Was he simply just a man? A great humanitarian? Or was he something more? What is so amazing about Jesus? Well, I'm going to introduce you to a key verse now. What was Jesus' mission? What was so amazing about him? Well, it says this in 1 Timothy 1, verse 15. This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. So that is the purpose of Jesus' um, coming into the world. He came to save. He came to save us from what? From sin. He came to save sinners. Now, this is such a, a, a powerful and simple verse, isn't it? But very profound. What does it mean to save sinners? We need to have an answer to this question. We need to have an answer, a biblical answer, I would suggest, to this question. And so what I'd like to do is briefly spend some time considering the problem of sin. What is it? How did it start? And um, then we can better appreciate the mission of the Lord Jesus Christ, because he came into the world to save sinners. So what does it mean? What does man need to be saved from? Well, it's impossible to speak about how the Bible defines a sinner and sin without really appreciating how it all began. So perhaps we could start by turning to Genesis and chapter 2 in our Bibles. The first book of the Bible, right back at the very start, Genesis and chapter 2. Now in Genesis chapter 2, we read of the account, I'm sure everybody's quite familiar with, with, the, with the general story, of how God created a garden, and in that garden he put the first man and the first woman, Adam and Eve, who he'd also created. And this is what he says to, um, to them in verse 16 of Genesis chapter 2. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil... Thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So God says to the man and the woman, you, you're free to eat of all of the trees in this garden, apart from one, this one called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God says to the man, the consequence of you eating of that tree is death. You're going to die if you eat that tree, Adam. <coughs> and herein lies a, a wonderful principle, doesn't it? Because God has not created man as a robot. He has not created and forced man to obey him. He has given man the choice to obey him or not. This is a principle we find all the way through the scriptures. As a slight aside, as Christadelphians, we believe that when it says there death, thou shalt surely die, that really means die, that Adam would be unconscious. There's no hint here of the immortality of the soul or living on after that death. If he ate of that tree, ultimately he would die. As it says in Ezekiel 18, the soul that sinneth, 
It shall die. And so we have this commandment then. It's very, very clear to the man. Now in, in, in the account, we also read of how Adam and Eve had access to another tree, a tree called the tree of life. And by implication, we understand this to mean that as long as they had access to the tree of life, their life would be preserved. Now, have a quick look at the next chapter, chapter 3 and verse 6 and 7. Because what happens is, in the first part of chapter 3, is we're introduced to a serpent who is a creature, a beast of the field, it says in verse 1. And using its, its beastly um, reasoning powers, it actually thinks that man wouldn't die if Eve uh, and Adam <coughs> ate of the tree. And this is what we read of in verses 6 and 7. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat. And gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed <laughs> fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And so we have here the first sin. The serpent had reasoned to Eve that she wouldn't die, and Eve had listened. Adam and Eve both understood God's law, but they chose to disobey. And so the consequence of this, as God had said in verse 17 of chapter 2, was that they were to surely die. So if you look at Genesis chapter 3 and at verse 19, God speaks to Adam and he says, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And so Adam now, he was subject to death. He was going to die. He was a dying, mortal creature. Later in Romans chapter 6 and at verse 23, we read, For the wages of sin is death. And so a change came upon Adam. He was now mortal. He was a dying creature. And again, I emphasize the, the idea that man has an immortal soul that lives on really makes a, a, a slight mockery of this, I'd suggest, because God has said, if you eat of that, you're going to die. You're not going to live on. You are going to die. And we'll maybe touch on that a little bit later. So Adam was mortal. But more than this, he had experienced sin. He now had a knowledge of good and evil. His eyes were opened. He had this physical change to him. And so in Genesis chapter 3 and at verse 24, we read of how that God drove out the man from the Garden of Eden. And he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. They had no access to that tree of life anymore. There was a barrier now between man and God because of sin. Now, I'm a visual person. I kind of like simple diagrams. So I've, I've come up with this. So I'll see what you think. So you have man and God together. But because of Adam's sin, there's now a barrier. Man has crossed over into a state of sin and death. Not because of anything God had done, but because mankind chose to disobey God. So what does this mean for us? What does this mean for mankind? Well, we just read Romans chapter 5. I wonder if we can um, flick back to Romans chapter 5, because in there, there's some key verses about the meaning of all this. You see, Adam had failed to obey God, the consequences of which have been experienced not only by him, but by his descendants ever since. Two things passed down from Adam and Eve to the next generation and the generation after that, right down until you and me come on the scene. Two things. One, being subject to death, being mortal. We're all going to die one day. And number two, a temptation to sin. And this is referred to in the Bible as the carnal mind or the flesh. A temptation within us, naturally speaking, to choose the ways of sin, like DNA, 
passed down through to all humans. So look at this in Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. It says there, Wherefore, as by one man, Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So, because of man, because of one man, that sin came into the world. And all had sinned at the time, because Adam and Eve both sinned, representing all of mankind. And so this death principle, mortality, and this inclination to sin, it passed upon all men because of them. It says in uh, other translations that when it says death passed, that that can be translated as spread. So as each generation comes along, this death principle spreads throughout mankind. If you look at verse 14, it says, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. So, death reigned over all of Adam's descendants thereon, even those who had not actually physically taken the fruit themselves, because all mankind inherits that same mortal nature, related to sin and death. They have that same constitution as Adam. And in verse 17 at the beginning, it says, For if by one man's offence death reigned by one, and we get the idea of death being, being like a person reigning over mankind. Mankind being restricted into this way of thinking with sin and death wrapped together. And so man is mortal. He is subject to that death principle. But also he has within him this temptation to sin. This is his inherent <coughs> nature. And as I say, these two principles, you can't re really remove them. They go hand in hand. This temptation to sin and mortality and death. And so as descendants from Adam, it is our misfortune to have inherited this state. We're therefore all sinners in that sense, related to a state of sin because of Adam, destined for death. I know this is getting a bit morbid. Don't worry, there's some positive stuff coming. But I will labour this because without appreciation the true position that mankind is in, I don't think we can really appreciate the real Christ. And unlike the humanistic society that, in which we live, which talks all about how good man is and the goodness of man, the Bible paints a very different picture about how God sees man. The Bible tells us that man's nature is sinful. It naturally does things contrary to God's law. For example, look at these verses, just a few chapters on in Genesis, just before the flood. And God, it, we read, that, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. This is picked up in the prophets in Jeremiah 17, verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked or sick. And the Lord Jesus Christ himself taught this because he says in Matthew 15, For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. <coughs> So, you see, as a slight aside, man's problem is not, as some churches teach, an immortal fallen angel devil. Man's problem is himself, his own inclination to sin that was inherited from Adam. This is how the Apostle Paul take, uh, talked about it by inspiration in Romans 7. He says, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. Even the Lord Jesus Christ, when someone called him good master, he turned round to them and he said, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. And Romans 7 again, 
the Apostle Paul through inspiration, Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. He's talking about the sin principle, the inclination to sin, the temptation that comes naturally to man. Now, I don't know um, if we can turn over to James chapter 1 at this point, because James chapter 1, it actually talks to us about the process by which sin um, is conducted and the consequence of sin. So in James chapter 1, and we have this whole lesson reinforced. We read, for example, in verse 14, that when every man is tempted, he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And then in verse 15, then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So you see, man is drawn away from the things of God by his own lust. That lust that comes naturally to him. And when he gives in to that lust, he sins. And ultimately, because of sin, that brings forth death. As I've mentioned in Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. So we've got a problem then, haven't we? We've got a problem with sin. And that's the bad news. And as I say, I've made, I make no apology of really laboring that. Because without appreciating that, we can never really appreciate the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, we might take a step back and think about this. Because God is a righteous God. And God said, if you sin, you will die to Adam. So, but God is also a loving God. And God has a plan and a purpose, ultimately, to fill this earth with men and women who are completely immortal and who will glorify him in a, fu a future time. So God, how could God deal with this situation? Well, there's a couple of things he could have done at the time when Adam um, fell. First of all, he could have exterminated Adam and Eve. He could have completely wiped them out. That would have been a righteous thing to do in a way because he had said, if you sin, you will die. So he could have destroyed all the humans, and that would have upheld his righteous law. But at the same time, that would have been to confess failure. And God does not fail. He had set forward this plan in his creation, and so it was not possible for God to fail. He had not made the earth in vain. So how else could he have dealt with it? Well, the second thing, I suppose, is that he could have tolerated sin. He could have said, well, don't worry about it. I won't, I won't uphold the law that I've just said to you, Adam. But that would have made God a liar, wouldn't it? That wouldn't have been righteous. That wouldn't have been right to God to do that. So that was also impossible. So how does this fit together? Well, the Bible teaches us that there is a middle way, a way in which God's righteous principles and his righteous law would be maintained, but also a way in which sin could be forgiven and the breach that had been made by Adam could also be healed. The Bible teaches, as I've said, that men and women will one day stand on the earth as immortal beings with no temptation to sin, completely forgiven for all their sin. But how could such a method be put into place that would be consistent with God's rightness. Now, how that's happened has been exhibited to us in the birth, life, and death of the real Jesus Christ. As a loving God, God has made a way of salvation on his terms, not instigated by man, but by God himself. And so now perhaps we can begin to see the enormity of the Lord Jesus Christ and his mission. Jesus came into the world to save sinners. The purpose of Jesus was to open that way. We need saving, ladies and gentlemen. And he had to remove that barrier that Adam created. So who was Jesus then, and how did he open up this way of salvation? We might ask 
various people who they thought Jesus was. And depending on who we might ask, we might get different answers. You see, atheists would say that Jesus was no more than a nice man, a great religious leader who went around doing good works, and that's all he was. If we ask a church theologian, they might come and tell us that Jesus was actually God himself, a part in, in, a, in a Trinitarian Godhead, the Trinity um, most churches believe in. But the position the Bible takes and the position we will be presenting to you this evening, tonight, fits in between these two extremes. So maybe we could turn over to Luke chapter 1. As we say, Christmas is coming and many people are going to be reading Luke chapter 1. Um, and perhaps you will be in the, in the next coming days. But I wonder if you've ever thought about the implications of some of these words. Because before Jesus was conceived in the Virgin Mary, you may remember that the angel Gabriel comes to Mary and he has certain things to say to Mary. This is what he says in verse 31. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. So Jesus was to be a human being. He was to be the son, though, of God. And this had been revealed in the Old Testament prophets. For example, in Isaiah chapter 7, we read, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, and this is the fulfilling of those Old Testament prophecies here, that the Holy Spirit would come on Mary and she would um, give birth without any man being, um, being um, present. Now, as a slight aside, ladies and gentlemen, have you noticed there how it says that ultimately the Lord God would give unto Jesus, at the end there of verse 32, the throne of his father David, now, we're not going to have time to delve into this massively. I believe on Sunday, God willing, we're going to be having a talk about Jesus the King. And this is very much um, connected to that. But in passing, I would just like to mention that the throne of David was a literal throne in Jerusalem. We read about it in 2 Samuel, for example, chapter 7, where Jesus is, is promised as to be a seed of David. <coughs> David ruled from Jerusalem, and as Christadelphians, we believe that the literal kingdom of Israel is once again to be re-established on the earth when Jesus returns. But perhaps a bit more on that a little, a little later, God willing. Why don't we have a quick look at, um, at verse 35. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Spirit shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also, that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So here we have the basis of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was to be the Son of God, he was to, but also he was to be born of Mary. He was to be a son of, uh, he was to be a, a, a descendant of, of a woman, a human being. He was to inherit human nature from Mary. But as the son of God, he'd be strengthened to Im overcome the impulses of that nature. And that's really the significance of his birth. And I wonder sometimes when, when Christians read this, whether they really appreciate that that is what is being taught to us in these words. You see, Jesus because he inherited the same nature um, as us, he had the same problem as us. Now let me show you some verses. Watch this. For as much then as the children are partakers, the children being us, like mankind, the descendants, are partakers of flesh and blood, he, Jesus, also himself likewise took part of the same that through death, he might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. That's Hebrews 2 and verse 14. Now what that's telling us is that Jesus had the same physical makeup 
as us. And that consisted, as we've shown, of a nature which tempted him to sin. He was a man. He inherited that same nature with its proneness to sin. But there was one difference, that he was unique in that he did not sin once, never sinned. We also note here that, that we read that through death, Jesus was to destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. Now, I've already mentioned that as Christadelphians, we, we don't believe in immortal fallen angel devil. What is this talking about then, you might say? Matt, you know, this is talking about him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. Well, we believe, and I believe, that that is talking, it's using a literacy device called personification, where something is given that kind of um, personality. Remember we re read that death reigned from Adam to Moses. Well, death doesn't, is not a real thing that reigns. It is personified as, as a ruler in that passage in Romans. And here is the same idea. You see, the devil here simply means the diabolos, the, the false, uh, it, that's the word in the, in the Greek. It means a false accuser, a liar. And it is that that is innate in us that causes us to sin. It's like the same lie of the serpent, that the serpent said to Eve, you're not going to die if you eat of that fruit. So what we're saying is that the devil is the one that has the power of death. And that is sin. That is the sin nature that we bear. Yet the Lord Jesus Christ, although bearing that nature, he did not sin. He destroyed that power. Some other verses we've got on the screen. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. For God hath made Jesus, him, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that he might be made the righteousness of God in him. And in Romans 6, verse 10. For in that he died, this is Jesus, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. It says in Romans 1. Verse 3, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. And perhaps this is one of another key verse that is worthy of note at this moment. Romans 8 verse 3, that God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin... Or, or better, as it's better rendered in, in the margin, a sin offering, condemned sin in the flesh. So Christ was both the Son of God, but he also was flesh and blood. Physically, then, he had the same problem of the temptation to sin as us. He had that cause of sin in him, the nature that he had inherited through his mother from Adam. But as we say, he overcame the temptation to sin. He never sinned. And that is why Christ went to the cross. Because he was one of us, a perfect representative of mankind. And God required him to crucify the cause of sin, human nature, as an offering. He was obedient to God, even to the point of death. And in so doing, he condemned sin. And where did he condemn it? He condemned it in the flesh. The Bible says that in this regard, Jesus was completely unique. Nobody else has ever been able to not give in to the temptation of our nature. It says in Peter that Jesus did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. And in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, it says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, <coughs> but was in all points tempted, like as we are, yet without sin. And so you can see there that Jesus, our great high priest, he could have sinned because he was tempted to sin in all points, like as we are. But he didn't. He overcame because he was the Son of God and he had that power to resist. So who was Jesus then, this one who was the Son of God and the Son of Man? Well, he, the Bible tells us that he was a Jew. And he was born to a poor family around 2,000 years ago 
He grew up in a, in a little village called Nazareth, just to the west of the Sea of Galilee and in the north of Israel. And the Bible tells us that from his birth, he set about to do God's work. And he is known, as you read the Gospels, for his selfless, his compassionate, and also his controversial teachings, his challenging teachings. You remember some of them, for example, this one in Matthew 5, he says, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Now, what a challenging teaching that is. So different to how human beings think. This is the teaching of Christ, which he learned from God. In that same chapter in Matthew 5, verse 39, he also taught this. He says, but I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. What a, what a challenge, ladies and gentlemen. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ Although physically he had the problem that we have, mentally his mind was soaring as if it was in heaven itself, as he thought and was so in tune with his father. And so Jesus, he showed forth God's thinking in his life. He manifested, he clearly showed God in his life on earth. And this is what he said. He says in John chapter 3, Four, verse 34 he says my meat or my food is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work now you see here that that Jesus says his whole goal is to do the will of God that's what he was about that's what his focus was in his life but look at this to balance that off just before he's going to go through with the terrible crucifixion he lies down in the garden of Gethsemane and he says to God in prayer father if thou be willing remove this cup from me nevertheless not my will but thine be done and so doing the will of the one that had sent him doing the will of God was not the instinctive desire of his flesh because in him he had this other will and he prays to God there that that cup would be removed that the cup it represents the pain and the trouble that he had to go through but he says nevertheless God not my will but thine be done and he always did the will of his father now some people have difficulty with this some view Christ as somehow being able to be above this but the scriptures are clear. He was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. And as we showed in James chapter 1, it's not actually a sin to shrink from pain. It would be wrong to submit to a temptation, to not have carried through in obedience to God. That would have been a sin, but it wasn't a sin to try and see if there was another way, because it wasn't his will. And so we see in Jesus a war going on. There was his natural inclinations, and then there was his um, heavenly Father's will and obedience to that. And so in Jesus, he always chose to do God's will over um, his own natural inclinations. We read in Philippians 2, verse 8, that he had to become obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And in Ephesians 5, verse 2, we read and that we are to walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savour. And so we read here that, that Christ died a sacrificial, painful death in utter submission to the will of his father. Now why did he need to do this? Why was this the purpose of a loving God? To make his son go through such a painful and awful death? Because, as we have seen, Christ's death was to mean something. It meant something greater than just dying. It was a declaration of something far greater. It was the condemnation of 
of his human nature. Remember that verse I read to you earlier in Romans chapter 8, that God sending his own son in likeness of sinful flesh and for a sin offering condemned sin in the flesh. He was to condemn that sin in his flesh. He was to overcome those temptations. He was to reverse the effects of Adam's fall. And only one who possessed the inclination to sin and yet overcome its temptations could completely be that complete sacrifice to take away sin. You see, Jesus had to die because he possessed our sin-cursed nature, that temptation to sin. Yet, because he did no sin, it wasn't right that he should stay in the grave. He didn't deserve those wages of sin, which was death. And so he was raised from the dead. This is what it says in Acts chapter 2, verse 22. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. And you get the idea that, that mankind is being held on to by death. But because Jesus did not sin, he was set free from that. They, those, those, that grip of death was, was loosed upon him, and so he was raised by God. And so because he did not sin, but died in complete obedience, God has given him eternal life, removing that mortal nature. And God's righteousness has been upheld in this. Because the flesh, with its inclinations to sin, that was inherent from Adam through generation to generation, has, and that has rightly been associated with death, has been, um, has been associated with death, rightly so. And that is why it was right that Jesus died, but also right that God has raised him from the dead. Now, we want to be quite clear here that as Christadelphians, we, we do not believe that Jesus was part of the Trinity. He was not actually God. We want to be quite explicit about this. It's very clear in the Bible who Jesus was. We read in 1 Timothy 2 verse 5, there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And bear in mind that was written after Christ has been raised from the dead. He's still called the man Christ Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 11 verse 3, the head of every man is Christ and the head of Christ is God. So there's two beings, there's a hierarchy, there's God and there's Christ. In John 20, verse 17, he, it, Jesus says, I ascend unto my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. And in 1 Corinthians 8, uh, 3, uh, sorry, 8, verse 6, there is one God, the Father, and one Lord Jesus Christ. They're two different beings. And, and as I say, we think we, um, we do have a, a distinct understanding of this amongst Christianity. The idea that Jesus is co-eternal and co-equal with two other personages in a Trinitarian Godhead is not taught in the Bible. In fact, the word Trinity is not in the Bible at all. And, you know, we read in Luke chapter 1 how that Jesus was to be the Son of God. You might note that a lot of churches teach that Jesus was God the Son. But again, that phrase, God the Son, is never found in our Bibles. He was the Son of God. Again, we, we could speak on this for, for some time, but hopefully we've done enough to just to mention that to you. I don't think I would have been doing my job properly this evening without touching on that. So let's just take a breather and just recap then. Jesus was a man and had temptations to sin. Despite this, he remained sinless in that he never broke the laws and commandments of God. And Jesus brought that human nature into perfect obedience to God and that was ultimately tested to its absolute limit in that he was prepared to die that agonizing death of crucifixion and obedience to his heavenly father there could be no sterner test could there from than that but because he'd done no sin Jesus was therefore raised from the dead and that is our understanding of the real Jesus Christ but what does this mean for you and I 
Well, not only did Jesus destroy the sin and warred against, that warred against um, the will of God in his own flesh, the Bible tells us that he also took upon him and destroyed the power of sin of God's people for all generations. That because Jesus did that, because of the sake of Christ, that God is willing to remove sin from us. And that Christ's sacrifice was retrospective, current, and future in its application for all those who believe in God. And he becomes a representative, a representative to those who wish to please the Father, who, to those who are willing to accept the worthlessness of the natural instincts of the flesh. God is willing, on account of a faith, in the work of Christ, to forgive sin. He has provided the perfect sacrifice for sin and accomplished the atonement or reconciliation, the healing of that breach between God and man. The breach in that relationship has been repaired through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe we could turn back to Romans chapter 5, please, and we'll read... Um, a few verses out of there, just to highlight this amazing and wonderful thing, this amazing point and message of the Bible. Romans chapter 5, look at this in, in verse 8. But God commendeth his love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, or forgiven through his blood, we shall be saved from wrath, through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement, the reconciliation, the margin says. So we are reconciled to God through Christ. Have a look at verse 18 towards the end of the chapter. Therefore, as by the offense of one, Adam, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so, by the righteousness, the rightness of one, Jesus Christ, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made or constituted sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. So through Christ we have been deemed righteous. If we take Christ as our representative, instead of Adam, we are be able to become righteous, not because of anything we have done, but because of our faith in what the Lord Jesus Christ has done. We have to have faith in the righteous principles and declaration that was shown in Christ's life, death, and resurrection. Just flick back a couple of chapters to Romans chapter 3 and look at verse 22. It says there, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. So we have to have this faith, this, this faith and believe in the rightness of God, in what God has done through Jesus Christ. Keep reading, verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace, by God's love, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation that word means a mercy seat or a meeting place. Uh, uh, he's, he's had that reconciliation. We're meeting again there with God through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. So we have to have faith in the righteousness of God. That's the question then we've got to ask ourselves. Do we have faith that the shed blood of Christ declares God's rightness. If so, how was God right in allowing his son, who had done no sin, to die? 
How was he right in then raising him from the dead? This only makes sense, I suggest to you. It only makes sense if God declared on the cross that human nature itself was the problem, that human nature has to be destroyed. It was right that Jesus had to die because he was of flesh. And he had borne that sin-prone and mortal nature, the diabolos, the source of human sin. And that sacrifice that he declared, uh, in that sacrifice he declared that God was right to execute his judgment on man because of sin and because man bears that nature. And it is so important that we have to appreciate this. The Apostle Paul, through inspiration, he, he emphasizes this. He says it again in verse 26. He says, to declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. And so we have to believe that it was right that sin was condemned in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is through that belief, that mechanism, that one can become acceptable before God. This is the gospel in relation to Jesus. And so my diagram again. We have this situation where man was with, with God and, and then Adam sinned. And so man enters a state of sin and death. But by Christ's sacrifice, by associating ourselves with that, we can have a reconciliation once again with God. And God is willing to do this on account of faith and striving of obedience. If we, if we can do that, God is willing to reconcile with us. And so how do we declare that faith? How do we associate ourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, the Bible's clear on this as well. Jesus says in Mark 16 to his disciples, he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So baptism then is, is a practical thing we could do to adopt Christ as our representative. You see, most of mankind are in Adam, we read in the Bible, but through, through faith in Christ and baptism, we can become in Christ. What is baptism? Well, it's a symbolic act of going down into water and coming back up out of it. It's saying that we agree with the principles of Christ's death and that God was righteous in raising him from the dead. We can do nothing with our flesh, but put it to death. God is right in this, even with his son who did no sin. He's right in demanding that the flesh had to die. That's what God is saying to us in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you see how important it is to then appreciate what Jesus has done. He has declared that God is righteous. And because of this, God is willing to forgive our sins on account of what he's done. And this is such a different message to that of mainstream Christianity, isn't it? that teaches that Christ died instead of us as a substitute. No, Christ died to represent mankind. He had our problem. He overcame our problem. He declared God's righteousness. And that's what, as Christadelphians, we associate ourselves with. And so the fact that Christ is now risen from the dead and sits at the right hand of God gives us absolute assurance that those in Christ will also be raised from the dead. So when will Christ's followers obtain eternal life? Well, the Bible teaches very much that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to return to the earth. And when he does, he shall raise up those responsible to God through the knowledge of the gospel. For example, we read this in 1 Corinthians 15. But now is Christ risen from the dead? And become the first fruits of them that slept or, or that have died. For since by man came death, Adam, by man came also the resurrection of the dead, Christ. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. So Christ is the first fruits. He's the first um, person to be given eternal life. 
And if we associate ourselves and are in him, then when he comes again, you see at the end there it says, afterward they that are Christ at his coming, we also have, will have that opportunity to have eternal life. And that is when, as we've mentioned, the kingdom of God will be established on the earth and Christ will sit again on the throne of his father David. It's another verse that proves this in 2 Timothy 4. It says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick or the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. That's what we as Christadelphians are waiting for. We're waiting for the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ, his return to the earth. We're waiting for the resurrection of the dead. But in the meantime, we wait. While we wait for that glorious kingdom age, this is what we seek to do as a community. Jesus says to us and, and to those at the time, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And so after baptism, we have to follow Christ's example, denying himself, his own inclinations, his own natural will. We've got to try and do that ourselves. Although we'll do it imperfectly, we've got to try and follow after the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. And although we will fail, we have the assurance that on account of what Christ has done, our sins can be forgiven if we approach the Father in prayer. And in God's love and his mercy, we'll be given that gift of eternal life when he returns. And so this is what we as Christadelphians are looking for and are seeking to do. It says in Philippians, for our conversation, our way of life is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. That's what we're waiting for. So this then is the impact, the challenge, the wonder of the message of the Bible, of the real Jesus Christ, who was not part of a trinity. He was a man who had the same problem as us, the flesh, mortality and the temptation to sin. But a man who never once gave into it, who died in obedience as a sacrifice for us to show how worthless that flesh was. And because he did no sin, he was raised from the dead, having gained salvation for himself and for those of us who wish to associate ourselves with that great work. For his sake, God in his love and mercy is willing to forgive sin, willing also to raise us from the dead and give us eternal life if we agree and believe in the principles that were declared in Christ's death. If we agree that the natural position we are in of flesh is absolutely worthless, that its propensities to sin are worthy of destruction, and that God is right to associate this with death and, and to continue that uh, penalty, if we, are, if we are happy to do that, and if we also associate ourselves with the work of the Lord Jesus Christ and accept the wonder of, of his death, and his resurrection, then we can have access to that reconciliation with God through baptism by taking Christ as our representative instead of Adam. And then after this, by adopting his life as a pattern for our own. I just want to leave you with one final thought. You know, it says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. It says, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. You see, we saw in Romans that all had sinned. Mankind, you see, is in the wrong. But we can be reconciled back again to God in the Lord Jesus Christ. We didn't have to be reconciled, did we? Because we were the party in his hostility. Now normally the party in the wrong 
should be looking to the party in the right to be reconciled, but not in this case, ladies and gentlemen. You see what it's saying there? That God is asking us to be reconciled to him through the way that he set out by belief and baptism in the Lord Jesus Christ. But God was the party in the right. Wow. What a loving and glorious God. And the question should be, for each of us here, what, what is our response to this? The fact that God has reached out and invited us to be reconciled again with him, the almighty creator of the heavens and the earth. Are you prepared to accept that invitation to be reconciled again through the word of reconciliation? And we hope, like us, the Christadelphian community, you will stand in awe and appreciate these great things that has been offered to us. And so we hope what you have found, this, uh, what, what you've heard this evening has been interesting to you. And as we say, we've endeavoured to proclaim the real Christ, the true teaching of the Bible on this matter. Now, we know that what, what we've done this evening is covered a lot of ground in, in quite a short space of time. And we know that some of these subjects, they're quite deep and um, you know, we've only touched on some of them, they're not always easy to grasp, especially if you've just heard some of these things for the first time. And some of the subjects that we've touched on, for example, like the kingdom of God, we've, we've, hardly, even, you know, we've hardly even scraped the surface, and they are also crucial to our understanding. And so we would like to therefore encourage you to study the Bible more, and we invite you to our free Bible talks. We hold these every Sunday. I'm sure Simon might mention this uh, in concluding. And uh, we'd also, there's, there's lots of Christadelphians in the room, so if you did have any questions, we, we're going to take some questions in a minute, but if you did have any questions, then any of the Christadelphians, I'm sure, in the room would be happy to, to, to try and answer them for you. So thank you for your time, and we hope what you've, you've heard this evening has been interesting to you as we've looked at the real Christ, Jesus, the Son of God.